from the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska. This is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. With the nickname Blueberry Tommy, Thomas Johnson sounds like a harmless and even friendly historical figure. But nothing could be further from the truth. Historians don't know much about Johnson, except that he was a serial killer. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting to you from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. For listeners in the Anchorage area, I have a book signing scheduled for May 27, 2023 at Barnes & Noble from 1 to 5 p.m. If you have a chance, please stop by. I would love to meet you, and be sure to tell me you listen to this podcast. Thomas Johnson remains one of those hazy outlaws from Alaska's past. What he did and whom he killed depends on which source you read. With little law enforcement and few people in the vast territory of Alaska in the early 1900s, murderers and thieves claimed their victims at will. The United States Marshals patrolled the territory of Alaska in the early 1900s, but settlers and gold miners knew they could not depend on the Marshal Service for protection. Whenever a federal budget cut occurred in Washington, the U.S. Marshals in Alaska were some of the first to lose funds. Little money existed for tracking down a fugitive, especially if the accused had fled the state. The crimes and lackluster pursuit of the Blueberry Kid provide a good example of crime and law enforcement in the early years of the 20th century in Alaska. Thomas Johnson claimed he came from Yarmouth, England in the early 1890s. He reportedly worked as a smuggler on a sloop in Puget Sound. Perhaps to avoid law enforcement in Seattle, Johnson edged up to Wrangell, Alaska, where he found employment as an engineer on a tugboat for a salmon cannery. In Wrangell, Johnson became infatuated with a young Tlingit woman named Mary George, and the two soon married. He was supposed to pay Mary's family a bride's price of $250, but he only gave her stepfather $50. When Mary's stepfather demanded the rest of the payment for the bride, Johnson gave it to him while on a family outing with his in-laws. Then, Johnson killed his young bride and her parents. He retrieved the money he had just given the stepfather and ripped a necklace of large gold nuggets from Mary's mother's neck. He probably disposed of their bodies in the ocean and hid their canoe in the brush. The only signs that someone had murdered Mary and her parents were blackened logs, part of Mary's bridal shawl, and some of her mother's clothes. Suspicion immediately fell on Thomas Johnson, but law enforcement did not have enough evidence to charge him with a crime. Johnson immediately left Wrangell after the murders and drifted to South America, where he worked on the Panama Canal Project for a few years. He then headed back to Alaska and tried his hand at gold mining for a short time before purchasing the steam launch Seal Pup in 1912. He ran the Seal Pup on the Yukon and the Yukon's large tributary, the Koyukuk River, where he ferried people and freight. He offered passage to gold miners and settlers working in the area. But too often, his passengers vanished before they reached their final destination. The Koyukuk region of interior Alaska is a rugged country, and while a few gold miners managed to make money, most barely survived on a subsistence lifestyle. John Holmberg, known as Fiddler John, was the exception, but he worked hard to make his claim pay. 
Holmberg spent a decade prospecting throughout the Yukon before heading to Wiseman on the Koyukuk in 1909. He staked a claim on the Hammond River and devoted the first winter to digging a shaft by himself through the nearly impenetrable permafrost until he reached bedrock. By then, the shaft was 150 feet deep. In 1910, he found gold, and lots of it. Holmberg worked his claim for two years until he had amassed a small fortune, and then he decided he'd spent enough cold winters in the interior of Alaska. He leased out his claim for $50,000 and convinced his fiancée, a prostitute named Marie Schmidt, or Dutch Marie, to accompany him south before ice filled the river and they were trapped for another winter. Dutch Marie had plied her trade in the Klondike near Dawson City. She'd saved her money and was also quite wealthy. Dutch Marie met Fiddler John in Dawson City and followed him to the Yukon. She was a well-known prostitute in Fairbanks, but she and John grew closer and fell in love as the years passed. Marie and John looked forward to a comfortable retirement someplace warmer than the interior of Alaska. By the end of the summer of 1912, Thomas Johnson had finished his seasonal work on the upper Koyukuk and was headed downstream on the seal pup. His earnings as a boatman for the summer barely covered his expenses. Holmberg and Dutch Marie wanted to travel down the Koyukuk to the Yukon and then on to New Lotto. In New Lotto, they could book passage to St. Michael on a larger steamboat. And at St. Michael, they would buy tickets on a steamship for a voyage to Seattle. Holmberg and Marie met another man, Frank Adams, who also wanted to go to New Lotto. When the trio saw Johnson and the seal pup, they felt fortunate. This was their chance to get down the river before the harsh weather and ice arrived. Since Johnson was also headed to St. Michael to leave Alaska for the winter, he gladly took on paying customers to help with the expenses. One source says that Fiddler John and Dutch Marie were intoxicated when they boarded the launch, and Fiddler John could not stop bragging about how much money he had made at his gold mine. Some people even speculate that John might have told Tom Johnson he was carrying $8,000 in gold dust. Tom Johnson, who felt he had worked hard and had little to show for it, must have seethed as he sat in his boat and listened to John and Marie brag about their combined wealth. Finally, it was too much for him. About 70 miles before the confluence of the Koyukuk with the Yukon, Johnson left the main channel and guided the seal pup up a blind slough before stopping. What happened next? would fuel speculation and gossip over the following several years. Let me take a short break. I want to thank Magic Mind, the sponsor for this episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Have you tried Magic Mind yet? If not, I highly recommend it. It's a little shot of green liquid. It looks like energy, and it is. I'm writing my next novel, and I was at the point where each day seemed like a slog. I wasn't getting anywhere with it. Then I began drinking a little bottle of Magic Mind each morning before I started writing, and I couldn't believe the difference. My novel took off in an unexpected direction, and I love where it's headed. After taking Magic Mind for a few days, I felt sharper, I had more energy, and most importantly for my writing, my focus improved dramatically. I love to sit down at my computer, forget about everything else in my world, and focus exclusively on what I'm writing or researching, and Magic Mind allows me to do that. Magic Mind is packed with brain-boosting nootropics, stress-busting adaptogens, and the natural energy boost from matcha. I'm so impressed with Magic Mind that I just signed up for a subscription for 30 bottles per month. If you want an energy infusion that lasts all day, give Magic Mind a try. The folks at Magic Mind created a great offer for me to share with you. Go to www.magicmind.co.co slash murder and mystery. 
within the next 10 days and use the code Murder and Mystery to get 50% off of a subscription or 20% off of a one time purchase of Magic Mind. Let me repeat go to www.magicmind.co, not .com, but .co, slash murder and mystery, M U R D E R A N D. M Y S T E R Y, and use the code Murder and Mystery. That's all caps M U R D E R A N D M Y S T E R Y. No spaces between the words. Go within the next 10 days and get 50% off of a subscription or 20% off of a one time purchase of Magic Mind. And crank up your energy level and lower your stress. The links for Magic Mind and the code are in the show notes for this episode. Johnson soon began walking down the shore of the Koyukuk, and another launch pilot gave him a ride to New Lotto. Once in New Lotto, Johnson found a job on the steam vessel J.P. Light and worked down the Yukon to St. Michael where he booked passage to Seattle in steerage on the SS Victoria. The Victoria departed for Seattle on October 8, 1912. On the Victoria, Johnson sold raffle tickets to the passengers and crew. One lucky passenger won a large gold nugget, and another a walrus ivory brooch. The SS Victoria docked in Seattle on October 16th, where investigators could later follow Johnson's tracks. Johnson exchanged gold dust at a U.S. assay office for $2,000, and he traded another $3,500 in gold dust with a saloon owner. He spent approximately $100 per day staying at the Hotel Victoria and drinking at a nearby bar. Johnson next traveled to San Francisco, where he arrived on October 21st. He visited the infamous Barbary Coast and stayed in the Tenderloin District, spending lavishly wherever he went. At the U.S. Mint, Johnson traded $7,000 worth of gold for cash. For a guy who'd only had a few hundred dollars to his name at the end of the summer, his sudden wealth seemed suspicious to investigators when they later tracked his movements. Johnson's trail suddenly grew cold in San Francisco. Reports claimed he'd headed for Wisconsin or Michigan. Rumors placed him in nearly every section of the United States at one time or another. Some historians believe he was murdered in San Francisco. After all, he roamed the roughest parts of the city while carrying a great deal of cash. Meanwhile, nobody immediately missed Dutch Marie Fiddler John, or Frank Adams. Adams's wife did not even notice her husband's absence until the following summer, when she began to wonder why she hadn't heard from him in several months. Around the same time, Deputy Marshal E.P. Heppenstall heard the musings of the locals, wondering why Holmberg had neglected his mining operation and the gold he reportedly had stashed at his claim. Heppenstall contacted U.S. Marshal Louis Irwin in Fairbanks, and Irwin turned to Special Agent Joseph Warren at the Marshal's office in Seattle for assistance. Warren scoured Alaska steamship records and found that Johnson had purchased a ticket from St. Michael to Seattle for the fall of 1912. Warren tracked down other passengers and crew on the ship and ascertained that Johnson had traveled to San Francisco after spending a few days in Seattle. In the spring of 1913, Koyukon Athabascan villagers discovered the seal pup scuttled in a slough on the Koyukuk River. Authorities did not make it to the region to question the villagers until a year later and nearly two years after the suspected murders of Marie Schmidt, John Holmberg, and Frank Adams. Investigators searched the boat and found two Winchester rifles, a few personal items, and clothing. 
They found no sign of blood in the vessel and no clues to suggest Johnson had murdered his passengers. In the summer of 1914, Native Alaskans from another village found a woman's body. The body was a few hundred miles downstream from where Johnson had abandoned the seal pup. The villagers buried the badly decomposed body on the river bank, and at this point, the story again gets hazy. Some accounts suggest the river flooded and washed away the grave, but other reports say water simply covered the grave. It is unclear whether investigators ever claimed the body and performed an autopsy or identified the corpse. Frank Adams had a $5,000 life insurance policy, but his wife could not collect the insurance until either someone found his body or the court declared him legally dead. In the summer of 1915, Deputy Marshal George Berg widened the search around where the villagers had discovered the seal pup, and he found human bones, Holmberg's eyeglasses, and a woman's clothing believed to have belonged to Dutch Marie. On August 3, 1915, an Alaska territorial grand jury decided they had enough evidence to charge Thomas Johnson with the murders of Marie Schmidt, John Holmberg, and Frank Adams. Now, all the marshals had to do was find and arrest Johnson. The search for Thomas Johnson was doomed from the start. Johnson's trail went cold after he visited San Francisco in October 1912, and the U.S. Marshal Service did not put much effort into finding him. It seems as though everyone had a nicknames in Alaska in the early 1900s, and authorities got confused while searching for someone they thought bore the nickname the Blueberry Kid. As it turned out, they found several men with that moniker, and they were following the wrong man. They finally determined the fugitive's nickname was Blueberry Tommy, not the Blueberry Kid. Investigators insisted they were hot on the heels of Blueberry Tommy, but they actually had no idea where he was. When the U.S. government withdrew federal funds from the investigation, the murder case grew cold. Settlers and prospectors understandably felt angry with the lax law enforcement presence in the territory of Alaska. Around the same time Thomas Johnson was killing prospectors for their gold, Ed Krause terrorized the Juneau area with his long string of murders of young men. Historians named Krause as Alaska's first serial killer, but Thomas Johnson could just as easily have claimed the dubious honor. A February 2, 1917 issue of the Daily Alaska Dispatch included an article titled, Brutal Murders in Alaska Unpunished, Lack of Funds Handicaps Officers, an account of the Blueberry Kid first operated near Juneau, incomplete list of murders in Alaska. The article lists the following unsolved murders and refers to Thomas Johnson as the Blueberry Kid. Dutch Marie Schmidt, John Holmberg, and Frank Adams were murdered on the Koyukuk, Blueberry Kid suspected. Mary George, Hans George, and Sikkeen Mary George were murdered near Wrangell, Blueberry Kid suspected. Mr. Brown and W.S. Slayton disappeared from Ketchikan, last seen with the Blueberry Kid. Mr. Smith, mining engineer, A.J. Whittington, and Crockett of New York, taken from Juneau bound for Latuya Bay by the Blueberry Kid. Never heard from again. Two men started down the Yukon River with the Blueberry Kid. Never heard from again. Two men were taken up the Malos Catchet River on the seal pup by the Blueberry Kid. Never heard from again. Mrs. Harp of Esther Creek brutally murdered in Fairbanks. No arrests. The article continues to list unsolved murders as well as several attributed to Ed Kraus. Some of the people listed as missing could have left Alaska unnoticed. Still, considering how easily Johnson killed his young bride and her parents and murdered Dutch Marie, John Holmberg, and Frank Adams, he likely killed others. 
With no new evidence and no sign of Johnson, the murder case against him was closed in 1923. In 1938, a federal judge dropped all murder charges against Johnson. No one was ever punished for the murders of Schmidt, Holmberg, and Adams. What happened to Thomas Johnson? The reason the federal authorities could not find him was that they didn't look very hard. He could have moved to any part of the country or the world and leisurely spent the rest of the gold he stole from John Holmberg. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. If you haven't already done it, be sure to join the Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier Facebook group and chat about the podcast. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.